Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar organized by the Istanbul Policy Center and the Hellenic Foundation for European Foreign Policy, LIAMEP, on the presentation of the second wave of a joint uh, Greek-Turkish public opinion survey. This survey has been uh, organized uh, by the two institutions with a general support of uh, the analysis and was held uh, by MRB in Greece and CONDA in Turkey. Uh, our collaboration aims to identify trends and opinions within the Greek and Turkish public opinion about each other, as well as about the common issues that uh, bring the countries together or keep them separate. And uh, today we have the opportunity to discuss this uh, with a group of distinguished experts on the topic. I am Ioannis Grigoriadis, uh, the Associate Professor at Bilkin University in Ankara and the head of the Turkey program at the LIAMEP. And I'm honored to moderate the discussion today. We will begin with some opening remarks by the directors of the two institutions. So I'll give first the floor to Fuat Kayman, a professor at Sapanji University and vice rector of Sapanji University and director of Istanbul Policy Center to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Yannis. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, us. Uh, thank you, George, uh, for the collaboration, the uh, fruitful collaboration. Uh, this is the uh, very uh, timely and necessary uh, meeting uh, uh, to enhance uh, relations between Turkey and Greece. But this time, uh, we do it actually on the basis of the uh, data uh, and, and ev evidence, uh, knowledge-based uh, you know, sort of uh, surveys that that would actually lead us to uh, certain to, to to comments and interpre inter interpretations. Uh, I think this uh, this endeavor is uh, timely. Uh, it was has been timely, but uh, with the Ukraine war uh, war, it become more timely. I think uh, you know uh, it, it 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 will be much more important to uh, have better relations between Turkey and uh, Turkey and Greece. And you know we we get the uh, first uh, you know sort of. Uh, uh, tips uh, from 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 the uh, from the uh, visit of, of of the Greek uh, Prime Minister to to Tur Turkey and uh, so so in this sense I'm very happy that uh, we are part of this 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 project this co this collaborate collaboration as I said uh, this time uh, we are enhancing relationship and, and and dialogue between two countries by by focusing on first and uh, data and I am uh, very uh, uh, eager to hear. Uh, the, 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 the comments and remarks coming from, from, from the experts. And thank you, LAMF, uh, for, for this cooperation. And I will actually uh, give the, the table or, or the place to uh, George Agalatos. Uh, thank you, George. The floor is yours. So, George, the director thank of LAMF has the floor. George Pagulatos, professor at the Athens University of Business and Economics. Thank you, uh, dear Fuad, for this uh, gracious introduction. And I too would like to welcome you on behalf of Elia Mep uh, to this panel discussion, which uh, follows our joint uh, endeavor, uh, data-based, as Fuad uh, said, um, a survey organized uh, um, between uh, the Aneosis Elia Mep and the Istanbul Policy Center with our partners uh, in Greece and Turkey, respectively, MRB and Konda. Um, the second uh, joint public opinion survey took place uh, in December 21. It followed from the first one, which had taken place in February 21, with a common questionnaire in both countries, many of the questions remaining the same uh, as the first wave questionnaire, not to confirm the trends reflected in the first poll or to indicate dynamics of possible changes. Um, and this joint opinion survey on the basis of similar questions for Greece and Turkey also aims to contribute to a better mutual understanding between the two societies, but also serves as an exercise of mutual self-awareness of each um, on each side. And this becomes, of course, even more important at times of bilateral tensions, such as the ones that we were seeing, we had been seeing since 2020. And it's a very welcome relief, as Fuat mentioned, that the bilateral climate has become much warmer following last Sunday's meeting between uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis and President Erdogan. And we do hope we can see a more lasting improvement and to be able to build 
upon the improved climate to make progress on the positive bilateral agenda uh, with a lot of items to be improved upon. Uh, what the history of our region and indeed of Europe itself demonstrates is that zero-sum attitudes often tend to lead to negative-sum outcomes. So there can be important mutual gains to be reaped from cooperation, not least of which energy cooperation, the window which is getting narrower for reasons associated, among others, with the European green transition. We are divided by the AGNC, but we're also united by the AGNC. So a different positive framing of Greek-Turkish relations is possible. We firmly believe this, and it will certainly represent the will of our two societies, because what both the opinion surveys show and was also established in the first round of surveys last year, is that there is a clear majority in both Greece and Turkey who believe that bilateral differences should and can be resolved through dialogue and conciliation. Uh, though I note with some concern a visible reduction in the percentage on the Turkish side in the December 21 opinion poll compared to the first survey of February 21, maybe this will be discussed uh, by the panel. But both societies recognize the differences between the two countries, but they expect, they demand the political leaders to engage in the direction of dialogue and conciliation towards resolving these differences, because uh, two countries, between our two countries, who are both neighbors and NATO allies. Uh, and this importance of dialogue, of course, becomes even more relevant as we all witness on our screens the horrors of actual warfare unfolding in Ukraine. I also keep another finding, a, a, a high concern, um, as shown in the opinion surveys about a possible military incident, higher on the Greek side than on the Turkish one. So maintaining bridges of dialogue between our civil societies is a strategy also uh, towards preventing such incidents from ever happening. An escalation could always spiral out of control and activate negative self-fulfilling prophecies. So we must find ways to engage, we must find ways to engage also the European factor as a positive catalyst in bilateral relations. Uh, this is challenging these days, um, but uh, given the actual freeze of Turkey's EU accession prospect, but customs union and a closer and principled EU-Turkey relationship can certainly be a facilitator of improved relations between our two countries. So many areas to be improved upon, and we at Eliamep are determined to maintain our long tradition of keeping the channels of dialogue open, engaging with our partners and colleagues and friends um, on the other side of the Aegean. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank once again our team at Eliamep, uh, led by Ioannis as head of our Turkey program, and especially thank our colleagues and friends of the Istanbul Policy Center, Fuat, Senem, Eylem, for this excellent partnership. And I pass the floor to Ioannis. Thank you very much, George, for your kind words. We'll now move to the presentation of the results. I will be presenting uh, on the Greek side of the Greek Turkish Opinion Survey, then Senem Aydin Dusgit from Sapanji University in Istanbul Policy Center will also add her own input into the presentation of the results from the Turkish point of view. And then we have two distinguished discussants. Professor Dimitri Strandafilou from Kadir Has University and Professor Elem Yanardaoulou from Kadir Has University, who will uh, offer some comparative remarks on, on, the pres on the results, given their experience and expertise on, on Greece and Turkey as well. So let me also concur with the point you raised, uh, Fuat and George, that a time of this event is very appropriate. Uh, when we planned this event uh, several weeks ago, we had no idea about the meeting between the, the Greek and Turkish leader and the sort of this uh, new beginning that we may be witnessing in Greek-Turkish bilateral relations. But what is very important, and I think that's why it is important to do the study of data and look into public opinions. Uh, public opinion appeared to be ready for this. So public opinion didn't consider the disputes in, in both countries, that the disputes are not resolvable or that there is not a possibility of seeking some common ground and common understanding in Greek-Turkish disputes. The disputes are recognized and there are different opinions, but it's very important to highlight that both sides understand that dialogue and uh, conciliation is the way to to seek a solution in these disputes. And as both of you said, 
this message becomes even more relevant and important in light of the terrible developments in Ukraine, Russia's invasion, and the realization that uh, threats of war can be turned into war if the conditions are appropriate for that. So we have to be very aware of this situation. And in that respect, the message that the two uh, leaders gave on Sunday that Greece and Turkey as members of NATO have some common uh, interest in some common positions uh, and uh, defending peace and stability in our region is at such a position. This is also another point that we need to keep in mind as we look into the future. As uh, both of you said, and I will go over some of the most important findings of the survey in my like five or seven minutes of a presentation, we asked uh, this and a number of the questions asked in the second wave were the same questions asked in the first wave. So we can actually have a deeper understanding of how uh, kind of coincidental or consolidated opinions, so opinions are in the Greek and Turkish public opinion. And we have added some additional questions that were asked for the first time and give us some interesting insights about how the two societies view themselves and view each other. So for example, I can refer to the findings we had on the question that uh, whether Greek-Turkish disputes can be resolved with dialogue and conciliation. We had 62.2% of Greeks and 57.7% of Turks that said so in December. Uh, the same answer was given in February of the last year, 59% of Greeks and 70% of Turks. So we see some we see some, some differences, some different trends, but the, it is clear that uh, a strong majority on both sides do support that uh, Greek-Turkish relations should be resolved by peaceful means. Another interesting finding that uh, emerged in both countries is the op opinion by both Greeks and Turks that political elites are to blame for the existence of bilateral disputes. So the argument it's not that the disputes are there, are structural, that they are beyond the will of the political leaders or the civil society leaders. They are there without, and we can do nothing about that. In February, 79.2% of Greeks and 58%, 58.1% of Turks stated that uh, politicians are responsible for the disputes between Greece and Turkey. On the other hand, there is some common uh, mistrust about the role that international actors, the international community, can play for the resolution of bilateral disputes. On both sides, there is a suspicion that the West or the United States or NATO or all international institutions, the European Union, are going to support the other side and not the the own side in the dispute. So this is something that appears uh, strong on both sides of the Aegean. Uh, and I can refer, for example, that this was the answer that 53.7% uh, of Greeks and 64% of Turks declared that the other side enjoys uh, uh, unfair support by the European Union. So Greeks think that the European Union supports Turkey and Turks think that the European Union supports Greece. Uh, another common interesting point we explored in this second wave is to compare uh, the level of pride that Greeks and Turks feel about uh, themselves, about their identity. And we can identify that both Greeks and Turks feel proud about their history, about their ethnicity, uh, their, uh, the achievements of their home countries in arts and literature. However, there is an interesting decrease when the questions refers to the quality of their political institutions. So for example, only 25.2% of Greeks and 32.4% of Turks declare proud of the way that the rule of law operates in their country. And that's interesting to see here that while we do consider that the rule of law is in a much better state in Greece than in Turkey today, more Turks think that the rule of law operates better in Turkey than Greeks. Uh, there is another interesting common point that uh, both Greeks and Turks uh, declare their trust 
and pride about their armed forces. This is 77.2% of Greeks and 82% of Turks. And an interesting difference that appears in the second wave is that 83.5% of Turks and 41.5% of Greeks consider their civilization to be superior than the civilization of other countries. Another common point, and I would like to conclude with uh, these uh, short remarks in my presentation, is that uh, in both countries we can identify that the left to right uh, spec uh, axis can help us uh, predict attitudes towards Greek-Turkish relations. So center-left voters are likely to be more moderate regarding Greek-Turkish disputes. They're likely to have visited the other country and uh, have more positive views towards the citizens of the other country. And uh, so uh, right wing, uh, far right wing, and even far left wing in the case of Greece appear to be more skeptical and more inimical towards the other side. So, uh, and of course, there is a very interesting other uh, finding which refers to the age gap, the young population, the youth, is likely to be more positive compared to, to the older population. And we suspect that this has to do with the fact that uh, uh, internet, like the possibility of uh, contacts uh, and traveling that becomes more available to the younger generations helps to mitigate uh, stereotypes and biases towards each other. There are a lot of other points that I would like to raise, but we don't have the time. So I'll now give the floor to Sanem. Uh, to share her views on the findings from the Turkish point of view. Thank you very much, Yanis, and thank you very much uh, for organizing this webinar as well. I was wondering whether I can share uh, my screen, right? Is that okay? Because I'd like to show you some of the graphs as well that we've prepared. Um, okay. Can everybody see this? Right. Okay. So, it's, you know, you one always has to check. So, <laughs> okay. Well, basically, um, oh, it's not full screen. Okay. Hold on. Um, hold on. How am I going to do that? Okay. Hold on. Uh, I, I don't think I can do that right now. Yeah, but I, I see I don't have my Zoom screen properly, uh, so I have it on the side. So that's the problem. Um, okay, you so it's very small. Shall I make it bigger? <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. Okay, I'll just keep it bigger and maybe is that better now? Maybe. Okay. Okay, maybe I can just go like this. Is that okay? No, please go ahead, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, now, what we've basically done is that, as Yanis has already outlined, this is the second wave of the survey, and I will try to summarize very shortly what we found in the Turkish data as well. And basically, um, what we've done, and by the way, um, the uh, analysis is also conducted by, by my colleagues at Özdeğin University, Ezgi Elçi and Evren Balta, and they also conducted a factor analysis of the results and tried to group, basically, the responses in terms of conceptual categories that we have observed in the data. And there, we have four categories. We have the category of reconciliation, which basically consists more or less of the assertions like Greek Turks are neighbors, problems between Greece and Turkey are created by politicians, disputes can be resolved with dialogue, and disputes can be resolved by military means. Then we have the nationalism as a second category where you know, uh, individuals assert whether they're proud of being Greek or Turkish, whether they think that the culture of their country is greater than the culture of other countries, and whether they think that the Aegean is a sea exclusively and only Turkish or Greek. 
In the enmity category, I know we are aware the word enmity isn't a nice one, but uh, it really is the one that's kind of captured the variance in data. So we felt we couldn't find a better word for it. Let me just put it like that. Um, where the assertions were, in no case would I like to have a Greek-Turkish neighbor. I would not be bothered or would be bothered if my daughter marries a Greek or Turk uh, or vice versa, or I could have a Greek-Turk as a friend. And finally, on security and defense uh, realm and category, uh, we had the assertions that the international community, foreign powers, always favor Greece against Turkey or Turkey against Greece. Uh, like uh, the one that uh, Yanis already mentioned uh, with regard to their views on international organizations and how they approach the Turkish Greek problem, that Greece enjoys unconditional land or unfair support from the EU against Turkey, and finally, whether or not Turkey is a regional power politically and economically. Now, what have we found? We basically tried to compare our findings with the first wave of data as well. And the major difference I think that we had here regarding these categories between the first wave data and the second wave data is that we found uh, nationalism and enmity on the rise compared to the first wave. Um, and what we also see, however, we see more or less similar uh, trends for reconciliation, for views on reconciliation, for views on security and defense, uh, but uh, we see, as you see, increases in uh, nationalism and also enmity. Now, another thing that we think is important for the Turkish data is that, for instance, when you see enmity and nationalism rising, we see that this rise is much more noticeable for those who vote for the constituents of the governing co uh, coalition or governing constellation uh, of the AKP and uh, the, uh, the MHP, known, of course, as the Jumurit Tepak in Turkish, right? And so while, in general, we also see that this partisanship is very much reflected in each and every subcategory that we have analyzed. In other words, while we can argue here that the Turkish averages in these categories and elsewhere are in fact quite similar to the Greek averages, we see that there is a lot of variation within Turkey regarding the parties with which individuals, with which people identify themselves with. And this, of course, reflects in, for instance, the fact that uh, there is a major difference especially in you know, feelings or perceptions regarding uh, nationalism, enmity uh, across uh, people who vote or who are sympathetic to AKP and MHP, to the Nationalist Action Party, to Justice and Development Party, and those who are in the opposition, who are more sympathetic to CHP and E Party, HDP, etc. That's the opposition parties. And of course, we think that this partisan-based view is quite meaningful, given that there is a whole also literature on partisan-based polarization that exists in the Turkish political scene. And so we see that this polarized viewpoints are very much reflected in individuals' views on the Turkish-Greek relationship uh, as well. Of course, this doesn't go for every single category. For instance, it doesn't go for reconciliation, we see that you know that different supporters of different political parties, either in opposition or the government, seem to be uh, sort of all in favor of reconciliation or more in favor of reconciliation, without a massive partisan-based difference there. And a similar uh, thing also goes for their views on security and defense. Uh, so this, of course, shows the importance of looking at the Turkish data from a party-based perspective too. Uh, and it also, I think, from a policy relevant perspective, it shows us that in the case that there is a change of political constellations in Turkey, there might be a much more communicable environment or a favorable environment for reconciliation or productive communication between the two sides. So I think this is important, or the data is important, the Turkish data is important, in showing us that, that and how it relates and how it might relate, relate to policymaking 
and communication between the two sides in the coming years. Of course, in the data, we also looked at, you know, usual variables like education, where uh, we expected to find that, and we did find it, that those who have who enjoy a high degree of education, university graduates, for instance, have lower feelings of nationalism and enmity. Um, but regardless of education, regardless of partisanship, people do want overall uh, more dialogue and more reconciliation. So there seems to be a convergence on that one as well. And that's also, I think, a positive note to keep in mind. On religiosity, similarly, we see nationalism, we see more hostile attitudes as the degree of religiosity rises. Um, and that seems to decline as the rates of religiosity or the level of religiosity also falls down. And we also have some data to measure how proud one is of their country. And even though this might not be 100% relevant to the Turkish-Greek relationship, we still think that it is an important data, which is why I put it on the slide, in terms of showing polarization as well. Because you see that there is significant level of low pride when it comes to the issues that relate to actual governance indicators, right? Rule of law, for instance, like democracy, like economic governance, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you look at those more sort of fuzzier or broader or more generic issues like the beauty of the country or nature or whatever, you of course have a cross-partisan um, divide and agreement. Now, yes, I think that's all I'm going to say um, about that, Yanis. I don't want to take too much of time because I know that our discussants would want to discuss on these results. Maybe I'll um, come in later with more. Thank you very much, Sanem. This is indeed very interesting. And we'll have the opportunity to have discussion and respond to any questions we receive from our audience. Now I will give the floor to Professor Dimitrios Trendafilou, who is a Professor of International Relations and Director of the Center for International and European Studies at Kadir Haas University. And he's been an expert on Greek-Turkish relations, so he is now on the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis, uh, for inviting me to this event, both Eliamep and the IPC, and uh, for having me on as a discussant. I mean, you know, I, I, I've, you were kind enough to send me the survey results and, and my title, the title of my presentation is, you know, I, uh, two titles. The survey results really say nothing new. Uh, and on the other hand, I could even put a, a, a sexier title, live your own exclusivist myths and applies to both countries. And, and what do I mean? I think we at least on the panel are all seasoned veterans of Greek-Turkish relations. I have a better understanding about this. Uh, the, the survey shows um, exclusivist mentalities, except for a couple of positive trends, but by and large exclusivist mentalities. You know, all these indicators about how much each side is proud of their history, of the culture, of their land, the beauty of the land. You know, it's this thing about what Greece is, the myth of Greece and the myth of Turkey for each side. Uh, and, and also a way, you know, that uh, both Greeks and Turks feel that they're at the center of the world. And so there are mirror images of each other in a sense of how they view each other, uh, which also keeps coming back to, you know, uh, keeps making me think about um, stereotypes and how, you know, uh, we have in Greece, and I think, uh, or not stereotypes, how Greeks or a large segment of Greek society and a large segment of Turkish society feel about each other. So, uh, you know, as Greeks, we always, I always make a reference to, to the saying of a, if a former president, uh, Christos Sartetakis, who said that Greece are a, a nation without brethren. And then there's that saying, that almost equal saying in Turkey about no better friend than a Turk, uh, for a Turk than a Turk. So there's that exclusivist nature that uh, each peoples are on their own. And I think a lot of the findings sort of reflect that. Um, there's also, uh, again, positive indicators, as everyone has indicated, has to do with the fact that, uh, and let me look at my notes here. Um, yes, that both sides, I mean, a large majority of both Greeks and Turks in both 20, the 21 and 22 survey feel that there's a way to live peacefully uh, with, one, with our neighbors and disputes can be resolved through dialogue and communication. 
While at the same time, and that's where the myth comes in, both sides feel have an exclusive approach when it comes to the AGNC, you know, and, and that's, that's sort of the historical long-term uh, uh, tradition of what, how each, how each peoples, uh, Greeks and Turks, uh, learn about each other and wh how they feel about each other. Um, and so, so this is something to keep in mind. And then the suspicion is there. Uh, and what's interesting, I mean, I, I'm trying to, I think it was George Pagulazzo at the beginning talked about the EU perspective. And I think the most interesting indicators for me are the governance indicators. Because the governance, the governance indicators, apart from the one about, you know, the army, fine, armed forces, you know, it's a respected institution in almost every country, usually. And it makes sense why it's respected uh, at such high percentages among Greeks and Turks. But all the other indicators about whether there is fair and equal treatment of men and women, whether there is, you know, fair and equal treatment of minorities or fair and equal treatment of refugees and migrants, about how Greeks and Turks feel their democracy works, um, uh, how their rule of law works, um, are indicative of something else. I mean, poor trust in institutions, but also, also for me, indicative of poor civil societies, of their ability as individuals, as citizens, to actually have an influence, an imp to impact on their governance. And, 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 and I think, if, and, and because this is something that's relevant for the EU, but on the other hand, we also know, and here I'm going to use some general data from elite surveys that I've done, Greek foreign policy elites and how they view their Turkish counterparts and Turkish foreign policy elites, how they view their counterparts, especially when it comes to Turkish elites, the very worry of the fact that Turkey's uh, uh, application and, and, and Turkey's monitoring go through Greece as well, right? And that's why the EU angle is, is so controversial when it comes to Greek-Turkish relations. But fundamentally though, when you look at those indicators, and, you know, these are numbers around 40% and 35% trust in uh, uh, the Greeks and Turks believe that their institutions treat, as I said, men and women equally and fairly, minorities, refugees and migrants, very low trust in how democracy works, very low trust about the rule of law, even lower in the 25% for the Greeks and so on. Again, uh, this is where one has to maybe think of a connection and build on that in that how do individuals become active? How do they impact on their political? Because this is also linked, therefore, to the question about, you know, their uh, a, a large majority thinking that the political elites are to blame. So it's not a structural differences, but the political elites have not figured it out. Um, and I think this is a telling thing. I think this is something I want needs to work further on and analyze uh, whether these indicators of poor pride in institutions, but that fundamentally are issues affecting citizens uh, could be improved and whether there's a way for the two societies to interact, exchange ideas and try to improve that. Uh, because if you know, we, we, we look at research on, on civil society, um, it's poor in both countries and it's very much top down as opposed to many other European countries or Western countries where these, these are valued more. Um, so, so this is what, uh, this is what I get generally. I mean, um, and that's why I'm saying for me, it's, it's more of the same. There's really nothing new. We know this is at the core of that. We know also, I mean, you know, if you link this to the meeting two days ago between the Greek prime minister and the Turkish president, um, the, the need for both countries to feel that somehow, uh, they are needed, they are trusted, they are wanted. Uh, uh, and, and this, I think, is also reflected somehow in the surveys, uh, e even when it comes to how they feel about, you know, they, I think the, 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 the whole segment was about the international actor and, and the suspicion about the others, right? In, whether it's the EU or other institutions um, and, and how they both feel that somehow these international institutions to which they are party to, uh, uh, support the other side more. So, so this is where we are. I mean, I, it, it really shows that there's a lot one could work with, but there's a lot also that's ingrained. And, and, and so the only way for me to, to, to think um, how you can somehow start going at that, you know, against what's ingrained in, in both societies about how they feel about each other and how they feel about the other,
uh, is to work on these governance issues uh, where the citizens have to become more active and, and take into their own hands what, the, what sort of societies they want. And this, and this might be reflected on how they would feel about the other, the other country and the other society. So this is my two cents on the, on the survey. Thank you very, very much, Dimitri, for your input. And now I'll give the floor to Professor Eilem Ganardaoulou, who is an associate professor and chair of the Department of New Media at Kadir House University. And she's also a non-resident scholar with us at the Turkey program at the So Eilem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yanni, for, for the kind uh, introduction. And it was um, actually um, a pleasure listening to all my colleagues uh, sharing their opinions about the results. And I have, um, I'm going to use the advantage of being the last speaker uh, after hearing all the comments. And I have some comments to make, and um, maybe sometimes I'll refer to my notes. Just to pick up where uh, Dimitris left uh, about. Um, um, trust, the, the uh, poor trust in civil society and poor trust in institutions. I think it's an important point that we need to make when we consider all these indicators uh, from the survey. And um, I really very much uh, value these positive indicators that, you know, most um, Greeks and Turkish citizens actually are in favor of a, a sort of a peaceful solution to all the bilateral problems. But I think um, what all these results are showing us, especially what uh, my colleague Sinem and, um, and Dimitris touched upon, is about societal relations, not necessarily hard politics. And we need to maybe focus on how, uh, as, um, as citizens, our views are shaped by each other. And of course, uh, coming from a media field, this brings me to the uh, notion and the role of media in this um, relationship and how these perceptions are shaped. So um, I think the poor trust in institutions is also an indication that we see in both countries as, um, as um, manifesting in the sort of uh, way that there is very low trust for media and news. And these are all related to each other. So I'm just going to sort of refer to some um, uh, findings from um, different reports uh, about media consumption and social media use in both countries, because I believe that um, we are similar in that way. And uh, I'm going to touch upon these things with a cautious optimism, because I think most of the perceptions are um, shaped on media, but we have to sort of be careful what kind of media we are dealing with. Um, so, for instance, um, both in Greece and Turkey, the use of social media is a high, uh, highly adopted compared to the European average, which is like 73, 74%. Um, and uh, although these numbers uh, are slowly declining, there is also very high levels of uh, loss of trust in news and other institutions. Um, and internet use uh, is um, relatively high in both countries, but uh, what we are seeing in both in Greece and in Turkey is that there's a lot of reliance on accessing news and information via social media. Now we are going through a, a conflict in Ukraine, and this is not just a conflict or a war uh, that is fought on uh, on the ground, but very much on on social media and digital media, as we are we are all following. So I think um, you know how attitudes are going to be shaped is going to matter a lot to how we use the media and uh, what we get out of it in both Greece and Turkey. Just to give an idea. Um, in, in Greek, almost 92% of all Greeks uh, get their news via online sources and 67% use social media as a news source. And um, most um, users are actually relying on digital born platforms rather than traditional media. And we know from the previous survey as well that in the traditional media, maybe there is an overexposure of Turkey as a threat, which might be sort of having a negative impact on the on the public opinion. Um, but what I'd like to do here is maybe to sort of reflect on a little bit about the importance of digital media 
as a threat and as well as an opportunity. Uh, Greeks uh, say that they prefer usually non-traditional brands, uh, unlike most other European countries, and they are following social media and blogs and digital born platforms. But some of these plat platforms, digital born platforms, may be actually reflecting more partisan views uh, than the traditional media and they might engage in these websites they might engage in uh, more sensational or clickbait news now this is important given the sort of um, poor trust in other institutions and in civil society and higher exposure so to social and digital media uh, given uh, especially the um, reliance of the younger generations who may have more positive uh, attitude uh, towards each other. Um, I think uh, there is a call to um, caution to be made there about uh, what is circulating on digital media when you know, most of the younger generations are exposed to and they find digital media as their resources. And I think this is a crucial point, uh, especially when we are sort of uh, approaching um, the anniversary of some very important events in both um, countries' uh, recent history. Uh, and we would probably expect a lot of um, information being shared on digital platforms and on social media. So um, perhaps we need to keep in mind uh, its impact, especially coming from a more sensationalist and more partisan uh, perspective. For instance, uh, the Greek followers will be familiar. Uh, news bomb GR is, um, is uh, with 34% shown in the digi digital news reports as the most referred to um, digital uh, platforms. Um, so, in a nutshell, I think uh, my caution, cautious optimism about the indicators in relation to um, Greece is about the potential of social media and digital media, but, you know, to be careful about um, there is um, not misinformation circulating, uh, and given the lack of maybe fact-checking institutions in Greece, um, this might be um, an issue that is going to reflect um, trust um, of uh, both uh, public opinions uh, towards each other. Uh, when it comes to Turkey, um, um, the followers uh, will be familiar, of course, and, and as my colleague Sinan um, uh, suggested that um, there is uh, the, the partisan uh, views, uh, the polarization is reflected uh, in the views in the survey as well. And uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, all the analysis on, on uh, media in Turkey, the media system in Turkey, is focusing on how the media itself is also polarized, first on a traditional and uh, new media axis, and secondly, uh, on the axis of um, whether, for instance, uh, TRT followers or ATV followers will be following other news outlets. So there is a polarization in the Turkish media, um, which may have an impact on um, on the um, uh, on the sort of uh, posit possible positive aspects uh, of these. Um, uh, viewpoints in, in both uh, societies. Uh, it will probably be the same situation for Turkey as well, given the high level of uh, social media use by the younger generations. Uh, so probably um, um, what, um, what I take from these um, survey results is that, you know, the age gap is there, it is showing, and the sort of mistrust towards media and other institutions is also um, showing itself, which may have potentially an impact on uh, whether increasing or decreasing these nationalistic um, views towards uh, both, um, uh, both countries. So uh, my take on the results of the, of the survey will probably be paying more attention to uh, younger generations the age gap, but how they receive their information, through which sources, and also to be maybe a bit more uh, cautious about the impact of the problems within the media systems in both countries, uh, which may have a negative impact given, um, um, given the, the context, uh, the sort of uh, 
um, the conflict uh, that is going on uh, in Ukraine. So I think I'm going to leave it here and uh, perhaps uh, we have uh, more discussion for later. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Eilem. I think I'll take the privilege of moderating uh, this event to ask a couple of questions first, and then I'll give you the opportunity to ask any questions you may have, and then we have time to invite questions from our audience. Let me ask with uh, Senem. Senem highlighted something that is quite striking in the, in the findings, that uh, the opposition alliance, the opposition front voters, tend to be more moderate or more friendly towards Greece. This is something that is not reflected in the official statement so far. And there is a lot of discussion in Greece that uh, uh, even if there is a government change in Turkey, nothing is going to change as far as Greek Turkish relations are concerned. Or there are those, let's say, doomsayers that say things may, go, may get even worse with a new government. Can you please reflect on that? Do you think that uh, this is uh, a, re a possibility, or is it just a strategy in order to uh, reach the elections and then things may be dif different? Shall I respond immediately, Yanis? Okay, well, thank you so much for the great question. Uh, well, I mean, I would think that, first of all, if you look at the opposition parties, uh, they're not one coherent whole. Right. I mean, you have the HDP in it, you have E-Party in it, you have CHP in it. So it's not so it's really a diverse constituency in many ways. And so this needs to be kept in mind. Uh, so you don't know who would be in the governing in a governing coalition, potentially, if the opposition wins. Um, second, so that would very much depend on that. Secondly, we don't know much about the foreign policy rhetoric of these parties as their foreign policy vision often is at the back burner, right? It's somewhere there, but it's not so much at the forefront and it's not so much visible at right now. Um, and third, I think for now, they want to keep it as safe as possible uh, on all fronts to be able to win or reach a winning coalition in 2023 elections. And so they will try to refrain from divisive issues as much as possible to keep that diverse, um, you know, political party spectrum of the opposition together. So that might be one of the reasons also that they're not contemplating very detailed scenarios or views. But the fact that the oppositional or the core oppositional voter base is much more sympathetic to closer relations and is less nationalist, considerably seem to be at least, according to the data, less nationalist, seems to suggest us that once and if they are in power, that we can expect more in the way of the Turkish-Greek relationship than we currently have. And I think that shows that there is some ground for hope there for a more constructive engagement, at least. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Dimitri, you highlighted exceptionalism as a common thread in the worldview of Greek and Turkish public opinion. And to some degree, this reflects on the view that each side looks into the other. So what can be done about this in your view? Why are we so self-centered as Greeks and Turks and we think that they were so special and our country is unique or uh, we're not part of a greater community that shares uh, common features, common values? like the European yeah. one or a global one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, <laughs> this is a, a difficult question for any of us to answer. I mean, it's, it's the way, you know, it's how we perceive our membership in Western institutions, why we joined. Uh, did we really believe, take the Greek example, uh, you know, in the, va in, the, in, the, in the values of norms and values, uh, or is it, you know, for strategic considerations that one has joined uh, both NATO, well, we both joined 70 years ago, uh, the EU, it's how we've tried even in Greece to always be at the core of, of, uh, of EU priorities, even joining the euro. It was about being there at the center, never mind how we joined. Uh, and so we were not willing to understand that we had to go through uh, a number of, of, of reforms to be able to join. 
Um, and, and I think that's also reflected in a sense that we feel, and I think Turks feel the same way, that we are not understood by others. And for the Greek case, uh, this has to do with, uh, with Turkey, the threat perception which has not dissipated. It might at times and might at times not. And therefore, being a flank state, we don't feel that we are understood uh, in what we are saying, uh, in, in, you know, in how... You know, what we feel, Greeks feel majority is this threat emanating from Turkey. Others do not seem to understand it. Uh, and I think, I think this is what creates the exceptionalism. Um, uh, and and, and, and it, it keeps, you know, being compounded uh, every time that uh, there is tension or uh, aggravated um, uh, and, uh, to the point where, because, you know, the news are very interesting in this sense too, uh, it's interesting, Alem talked about social media. In the Greek case, you and, uh, you and I know that um, you know, what, the most popular sort of segment in the morning shows is the 8 to 9, uh, 8 to 8.30 uh, segment where the foreign correspondents of the channels based here uh, in, in Istanbul uh, talk about whatever the last thing President Erdogan did, whether it's funny or not, you know, uh, and, and then there's a big discussion about it with, with uh, analysts such as ourselves and then with politicians and so on. And, but what happens in that sense is as you try to talk about developments, and I understand the value of you know, trying to un- explain what is happening because we are talking about you know, television, time is limited, so it all comes down in sound bites. And then you keep regurgitating the same thing. So the way threats or, the, or uh, uh, challenges from Turkey keeps coming up, certain key catch words, which I think have an impact on, on public opinion. And, and, and therefore, and then this is reflected in public opinion polls, right? And, and in wider perceptions about Turkey. Uh, while on the other hand, you know, and then that's why we conceptually, there's always a gap. On the other hand, uh, if I talk to my mother and uh, what she watches on TV, it's Turkish television series. And, she, and you know, the comment is, oh, they're so much like us, <laughs> especially the ones that have to do with family value and so on. And she, her, po- her comments reflect uh, a large segment of the population, too, that watches this television series, right? Uh, and they prefer them to other things on TV. So I think this is what it is. I, I think it has to do with... Uh, um, the inability to express, to make others understand of why we feel that, um, you know, whatever the Greek issues are regarding uh, Turkey and, and, and the threat that the Greeks feel, almost existentialist threat about, about Turkey's intentions and perceptions. And, and every little thing that comes out from Ankara and its political elite that uh, sort of, you know, uh, I, sort of is linked to that threat perception is used as evidence that what I've been saying, what I've been taught, what I know uh, has just been, you know, verified. Uh, and and, and, and that, that's sort of propagated. I mean, that's how I would interpret it, right? Thank you very, very much. And let me have a question for you. You mentioned how social media play an increasingly important role in uh, constituting the perceptions about each other in Greece and Turkey. And I will follow up on the point that Professor Triandafilou made, that there is a lot of uh, information, a lot of debate about Turkey and Greece, not the same debate about Greece and Turkey, but uh, the quantity of information, of course, is not tantamount with quality of information. So the discussion may be simply reinforcing stereotypes or maybe kind of re- recycling the same material that reflects on this. Is there a way to uh, enrich this discussion? Are there, like, what is the role of conventional media in this? Or sort of, uh, or other sort of unconventional media? Uh, Dimitris mentioned also TV series or soap operas. How can we contribute to a more like, uh, ref- representative and more pluralistic uh, sphere, uh, media sphere about uh, each other. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Uh, I think this is a very crucial point, this asymmetry. Uh, it's, it's very critical, the asymmetry of um, Turkey being uh, Greece's biggest security problem 
uh, this perception, uh, seeing uh, Turkey as a threat. Uh, but Greece is not Turkey's biggest security problem. And, and that's why um, maybe in the sort of uh, public opinion, there is less emphasis on what is going on in Greece in a given day, you know, in a random day. We probably, in the Turkish media here, we did not hear about what is going on in Greece as much as uh, Greeks do um, in Athens or in wh wherever they are. So there is, a, there is a critical asymmetry here, which I think is one of the major issues that is uh, impacting on the public opinion and how it's shaped. Because if you, as Dimitri says, if you wake up in the morning and eight o'clock, you start hearing about Turkey being the greatest uh, national threat, then eventually it will uh, sort of create uh, some sort of uh, anxiety or, or some sort of suspicion uh, without even uh, maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, audience realized. So I think this is very crucial. And, um, and I think there is a few things that can be done there. Uh, first of all, um, like we are, uh, you know, mentioning about the partisan uh, views, um, there is a partisan or polarized media, um, uh, especially in Turkey, but there is also a very dominant narrative in both countries how to approach national issues or how to approach uh, foreign relations. So maybe this could be a good way of starting uh, to create um, um, a dialogue between media practitioners in both countries, uh, how they can maybe, maybe overcome this uh, sort of nationalistic uh, narrative and what could be other ways of uh, approaching these issues without falling into stereotypes or without falling into a discourse about threats and uh, um, security, um, because you know, if uh, all the relationships are framed in terms of security, uh, then then you know we lose um, the sort of uh, other fruitful areas where you know in social relations more uh, dialogue can be created. Uh, so I think uh, I think younger generations are better doing this, you know, through exchanges, coming to our university, Erasmus, etc., through through traveling, but. I think um, maybe uh, uh, establishing good connections with, beginning with media practitioners would be a good step uh, to reflect on, on these um, difficulties and to how to overcome this um, um, security discourse. Thank you very much. Let me uh, add to this point, uh, on this point that uh, all results because we've received a question from our audience, will be available on the website of Eliam and the Istanbul Policy Center. And this will be reflecting both the results in Greece and the results in Turkey. So they will be accessible for researchers to conduct their own interpretation of the findings of the opinion surveys. And let me start with the first question we are receiving from our audience. Uh, our... Oh, According to Turkey Trends 2021, this is the Kadir Has uh, University survey uh, run by Professor Mustafa Aydin. Even if Greece uh, pose, ranks relatively low as a, in the list of threats against Turkey, so Greece appears to be 10th in that list, at the same time, Greece receives a low priority in the question uh, where should Turkey start in order to mend its relations with its uh, adversaries? So uh, Greece, according to the results of the opinion survey, does not appear to be a high priority. So the question is, how is this reflected in post-2021 policy of President Erdogan to repair Turkey's relations with a number of countries with which Turkey has had difficult relations. Of course, now we have the meeting on Sunday, so this might be shedding some light into this discussion. So, Dimitri, would you like to reflect on this? You know, I, I have a feeling that uh, the most interesting survey will be the next one. I think we, we agree that things are fundamentally changing. And I keep thinking about the meeting on Sunday, and I have in front of me, because I've used this in also in a number of interviews, so let me find this. So the, this is the statement by the Turkish presidency that was issued right after the meeting. And I think there's a very telling paragraph there. And, and 
So it says, it's the second paragraph of that statement. I'm reading it out. It was pointed out that Turkey and Greece had a special responsibility in the European security architecture, which was changing with Russia's attack on Ukraine. Uh, the bilateral and regional benefits of enhancing cooperation between the two countries and of focusing on a positive agenda were highlighted. And, and what do I mean? I mean, it's interesting, first of all, that it's, it's uh, Russia's attack. And that, that's the word used and not, uh, not a tougher word. But apart from that, recognition of the fact that there's a shared special responsibility of the two countries, I think is a novelty for me. If I go back to documents and official Turkish documents, when it comes to Greece, I think this is very interesting. Uh, and, and so, uh, and that's why I'm saying that these results and, and these surveys and these trends might slowly become obsolete. The, the, the before, you, you know, the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's like the Cold War and the post-Cold War era. We might be at that point right now. And we might see how public opinion is shaped uh, on the basis of, you know, people having a better understanding of, 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 of uh, what the new world actually means and implies, right? Um, and, and so if this statement reflects, it, it's something that's going to be a long-lasting statement, uh, a reflection of, you know, the need to work together, um, it would have an impact on, on changing perceptions uh, at, at all levels. Uh, if it's, it's just, you know, it, I mean, there's also the suspicion this is just... Uh, this is also a reflection of, of something that Turkey has been trying to do for a while, even be preceding, even preceding uh, uh, the Russian invasion with uh, the pres President Erdogan's visit to, to the Emirates and then the visit of you know, the Israeli president, which was planned anyway before the invasion. Um, and, and the turn towards, towards neighbors, neighbors and working with them, but also the turn towards the EU, where there's a recognition anyway because, uh, that that uh, Turkey's turn towards the EU, as reflected today also in, in, in the meeting between the German Chancellor and the Turkish President, goes, goes to Greece, goes through Greece. And, 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 and therefore, the Mitsotakis-Erdogan meeting is indicative of this, and, and even the reference to the, the positive agenda, which is a bilateral one, but it's also part of the wider EU-Turkey positive agenda. But, but I think we are fundamentally at a breaking point. You know, I'm trying to interpret, and, and, and I think there's going to be a big rethink. And, and, and so this presents also a tremendous opportunity, a window of opportunity to maybe sit down and resolve issues until that window might close, because it might close. But it might also be a window which allows for a new paradigm uh, we're all talking about and seeking to, 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 to emerge. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Senem, would you like to reflect on the question? No? No? Ayla? No? If not, then let's go to the next question we have. Uh, does low trust to institution create a suitable space for public diplomacy? This is a common feature in both public opinions. So what do you think? Would you like Senem to reflect on that? Uh. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, low trust in the institutions. Well, yes, I guess to some extent, but then of course, when you have low trust in institutions and society, it means that you have a problem within that society regarding societal cohesion and also democratic consolidation, etc., which does not usually translate well in sustainable relations in foreign policy as well. So I would not necessarily say that this is actually a plus in the way of intersocietal dialogue, because when you talk about intersocietal dialogue, how is that going to happen without the correct institutional channels that are necessary to deal with also the overarching geopolitical conflicts and issues that exist between these countries? Thank you very much. Elen, would you like to reflect? Uh, this actually question reminded me of a debate we had a few months ago back in Athens. Uh, Dimitris uh, organizes a Greek-Turkish Young Leaders uh, Symposium every year, and we were having a, a debate in one of the sessions. Um, uh, and the, the point was uh, that, uh, you know, there was a lot of... Um, um, responsibility weighing on the shoulders of civil society because the leaders um, were not able to sustain um, dialogue. So there was more expectations um, uh, 
from the civil society and uh, other um, societal actors. Uh, I think um, uh, Senam, uh, Senam's point is 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 uh, is valid, uh, definitely. But uh, under the new uh, situation now, after. Um, um, the visit in Istanbul. Uh, I'm actually wondering, I'm just reflecting, this may not be a, an answer to the question, but I'm just reflecting right now uh, whether this new uh, sort of formation of dialogue on the level of, uh, of leaders uh, might actually have a um, uh, have a uh, have a trickle down effect in the other sort of uh, social actors and social institutions because three four months ago uh, the, uh, the 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 perspective was rather looking um, 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 uh, dark but now th there there seems to be an opening new channel of communication between the two. Thank you very much. I have another question which is addressed to all of all of you, uh, while both countries' public opinions uh, argue that uh, the problem should be resolved through dialogue, in both countries, these issues that are uh, Greek-Turkish disputes are called as national issues. How possible? How can we reconcile this? How calling a question national issue makes it difficult to see compromise? Well, I, I could go first, but you know, the question is also addressed to you, Yanis. So, um, <laughs> yes, yeah. of course, I can, I can, I can, yeah. I can, if you want me to start, I can. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. <laughs> no, I think it is, uh, this reflects to uh, what you we've discussed already here. So, that on the one hand, there is some will and some goodwill on all sides to proceed with a peaceful way of resolving the conflict. But on the other hand, the way that the, the issues or the conflicts have been framed for many, many years in both countries uh, that not, does not allow room for understanding the other side or sort of recognizing that all sides have interests and points that need to be raised and understood in that dispute. So in that respect, this, in my opinion, at least I don't know how you think, this uh, provides an opportunity for all these institutions and all these activities that need to fill that gap and try to turn this uh, like initial positive will about resolving the disputes by peaceful means into a new understanding of what these disputes are and what are the true interests of the parties involved so that the solution can be achieved. So, Dimitri, would you like to? No, yeah. Uh... I don't really have much to add. I'm just thinking, you know, I, I just think sometimes whether our methodology might need to be worked on. I mean, um, uh, you know, Elam was referring to before on younger generations, so we need to focus on how they receive their information and where they get it from. Although she talked about getting media professionals together. But then, you know, I keep thinking these are things that have been tried in the past, as are being tried, but the media landscape is totally changing. When Rapprochement started, over 20 years ago, it was easier to have media come together. It was usually newspaper people, right, that got together, Mehmet Ali Biran, Papa Helas, and then a lot of others. Today, what is the media landscape? Is it still the traditional media that represents it uh, on both sides? Uh, or is it it's much more dispersed? And how do you, therefore, deal with even this whole question about, you know, the national issue perspective and deconstruct it and then have an impact? Um, I'm also thinking uh, because, you know, because of this crisis, uh, 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 both I and Yanis, or even because of Greek we, we we often appear on Greek media, so whether it's radio, radio or television. And then, interestingly enough, so because we are considered to be mainstream scholars, right? And so a lot of the mainstream scholars appear on mainstream channels. And then, but if you see now, the impact, and this is not a scientific survey on my part, but when I observe that, you know, my little segments on, on a TV show, five or 10 minutes, the number of views it has on, on YouTube, right, might be in a three, four, five, six, 10,000, which is okay. And Yanis's might have the same numbers. And then, but then I also see that there are many others, uh, colleagues, loosely used, uh, called colleagues, with maybe 
not so moderate views, not so mainstream views, much more to the extremes that actually do not get access to television as much, but they do use channels of communication such as YouTube and their views are in the hundreds of thousands, <laughs> which is very interesting in that. You've noticed that, Yanis, right? And, you know, and with some of them. And it makes you wonder, therefore, how, I mean, and, 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 they, and, I, and we know the discourse. We don't have to watch them. We don't have to listen to them. We know what the discourse is about, right? So, so no one is ever going to try to reach out to the other side. It's access to information and facts, which is great, but then in their analysis, they go all wrong because it's all about you know, their perceptions of the other. So how do you deconstruct the whole notion of national, the national issue and the national issue and reframe it in such a way that actually could be constructive you know, in terms of the relation between the two sides? It's difficult because there's a large audience out there that I wonder whether we miss it, whether that's reflected somehow in the polls that are done um, or a whole subculture, and I think it's, a, it, it's, it's there in both countries. Uh, in the Turkish case, it's ob- obvious through the trolls on Twitter in particular. In the Greek case, it's not so much Twitter, but it's, it's as I said, YouTube and others. And so I, I'm just thinking that methodologically, these are things we need to work on. I mean, we get results, but there is other forces <laughs> I don't, uh, out there that, that we need to, you know, that do not reflect the science, uh, the social science tools that we know, uh, uh, our disciplines, uh, they're more hearsay, but they're just as powerful. And, and, and I think they, are, they sort of are a bar to, to us uh, uh, really discussing these issues uh, and, and trying to, 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 to move, uh, to move uh, the debate forward. Can I perhaps add something, Yanis? Yes, yes of course. I mean, I do agree with everything that's been said by uh, Dimitri and yourself. Um, What I think about this issue is that, I mean, it very much boils down to perceptions of national security and in relation to that ontological insecurity, right? Um, And the more you build your ontological insecurities around this so-called antagonism between the two sides or the potential Turkish threat looming and that kind of thing or vice versa, then the more difficult this is to change just by, or merely by intersocietal dialogue. So perhaps what also needs to change are the threat perceptions themselves. And that's not necessarily something that Turkey and Greece can do alone, but most of the time when you look at the evolution of the relationship, that has a lot to do with external geopolitical dynamics too, which is, I think, why it's very important to see how that threat perception will evolve in the two societies in the next few years, because I do believe, I'm one of those who believe that this new uh, war in Ukraine will have lasting uh, consequences on Europe and the neighborhood, but also threat perceptions and alliances. And uh, and it will take a while uh, for us to assess how this impact will unfold, which is, I think it's very important to keep this in mind in preparing the third round as well, which is something that Dimitri had said also earlier. Um, but I think this is the key area around which we should be watching very closely to see if there's anything that can be picked up and worked on by the policymakers and also to society uh, to use that, um, because I think that's the fundamental problem. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Elen, would you like to add a point? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I agree with the, with the both uh, colleagues, but um, I think you know, getting uh, sort of away from this uh, threat and security uh, antagonistic um, uh, approach is the key to dialogue and uh, how we define national issues. Because when once we define issues as national issues, they, they might automatically become untouchable. But the point of dialogue is to actually unpack, you know, um, what is uh, stopping the dialogue there. So uh, maybe um, we need a new frame uh, of looking at these, uh, as, as Senam suggested, uh, looking at these, you know, uh, perceptions and to unpack them and maybe to consider them in a new frame. Uh, and, and this will be done by uh, policymakers, this will be done by political le- leaders for sure, but this will be also done on a civil society and, and um, mass media and social media uh, level.
this is why we need the dialogue to <laughs> come back to the question. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Thank you very much. We have two questions and I think we can conclude having answer as soon as we answer them. So I'll read them both and you will have the time to respond to both of them. The first question is actually linked to Sanem's latest comment. Oh, we have a third question. Okay. So let me start with the first question I have here. Can you find any similarities between the Sev syndrome or the division of motherland in Turkey and the prevailing sentiment of Turkophobia in Greece or this that kind of this obsession with Turkey as the uh, security threat, the imminent uh, security threat for Greece? This is the first question asked. The second question refers to the question, uh, the results of the question, do you think that the culture of your country is superior than the culture of other countries? Why is there this huge difference between Greece and Turkey? And uh, the third question is similar to that. Why is the percentage of Turks who think that their culture is superior than the culture of other countries is twice as high as the percentage of Greeks who believe the same? Is there a reason for that? So, Elen, would you like to start first this time? Thank you. Uh, I think I will pass the serve syndrome question and I'll leave it in the um, uh, hands of my colleagues to, to deal with it um, much um, capable than, than myself. Um, well, I, I think that was one of the very striking points, um, this, uh, you know, uh, feeling superiority, uh, feeling the superiority of your culture over the other one. And um, I, it just made me wonder if it's the way the question has been posed um, and um, because that might actually have an impact on the sort of reaction uh, given to it. Uh, but also I was, um, I was considering this result in light of, um, again, you know, um, an increasingly um, uh, um, polarized political environment in Turkey, which might uh, as Dimitri suggested at the beginning that, you know, even reflected in the idioms that there is not a friend uh, better than a Turk uh, for a Turk, that kind of attitude, which kind of maybe permeated uh, recently the, the, the sort of uh, public discourse. Uh, so that made me uh, think um, when I came across this uh, result. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Yeah, you might have to repeat the third question, but let me go quickly to, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, the culture issue, the differences, it's true. Superiority of, you know, your civilization or culture. And the Greeks, it's like 41.5% for the Turks, 83.5%. And the same th numbers almost are reflected in the 2021 survey. I, I, I have a feeling, at least from a Greek perspective, Greeks are more sure who they are. Uh, you know, you trace your roots back to thousands of years, uh, democracy, uh, oh, half the words in, uh, in, in Europe are Greek words, uh, and so on. Yeah, so, so it's not really something, I mean, interestingly, we just feel more secure about our identity. Uh, and I think uh, this is why the numbers might be so low. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's interesting. I was also looking at the percentages, but this is a pride question and it's very high, right? Culture for both countries is very high, but okay, that's pride, that's national pride, okay. Uh, uh, and even there, Greeks 81.6, Turks 91%. But I think it, it has to do with that. Now, the similarities between the self syndrome and um, the security threat. Yeah, yeah, the self syndrome obviously has an impact on, on Turkish perceptions. Um, for the Greeks too, we shall be seeing this over the next couple of years. <laughs> uh, you know, anniversary of uh, Smyrna, uh, the anniversary, which is basically fundamentally the end of the Megali there. And, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion about this. Uh, so far it's subdued, but it will happen. And as we move on to 2023, uh, and I'm sure big celebrations in Turkey about this, 
irrespective of when elections are going to be held, this is also going to have an influence, oh, you know, because fundamentally the modern part of history of both sides has to do with the other side. And I think this is some of the things that uh, concern the Greeks. Uh, and same, likewise, it's also reflected in the whole Hagia Sophia debate. And in what sense? Not, not only the part about, you know, um, uh, changing its status from, from a museum to a mosque, but I'm always amazed. I mean, I've been living in Turkey for 12 years. Uh, the celebrations that occur on the 29th of May and, and the 29th of May celebrations, right? So the anniversary of the fall of Constantinople and the big fireworks and so on. And we know who does these and why one does this, but I'm also impressed. So on the one hand by, you know, a reflection of, oh, we conquered the city, but why do you have to celebrate it? It's been conquered so long ago. It's really a Turkish city. But, but it's interesting, the debate among many in Greece about the loss of Constantinople still today, right? Still to this day, the debate uh, among many circles, oh, we lost and it's ours and we should be, which is no one seriously believes that Greece is ever going to get Istanbul back. But this thing in the public sentiment, and I, and I think... And these are all key events in the Greek psyche, in Greek history. Uh, uh, so, 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 you know, the loss of Byzantium uh, linked with, with uh, the, the end of the, the Megali there. Uh, so these are sort of what are the, the Greek, uh, the Greek treaty of, uh, the, the Greek self syndrome uh, issues, you know, that, that are relevant. What was the third one? Maybe, maybe uh, Sanam can answer it and you can answer the third question. No, I, I can do that. Actually, it was quite uh, similar to the second question. To give Sanem the last word, I can answer now, so I'll give her the opportunity to conclude our webinar. Uh, regarding the question on the cultural uh, superiority, I think that if we look into other European countries, even 40% is quite high. So it's not that Greece is very low in European averages compared to Turkey. Turkey's result, I think, is very, very high. And we may try to explain this by looking into what has been happening over the last 20 years in the context of AK Party's cultural debates within the country. Because AK Party comes from an Islamist background that always tried to look into the West from a sort of civilizational, cultural perspective. That's the West controls uh, military might or money, but justice or culture belongs on us, on the Islamist side. And to some degree, the Turkish economic performance in the last, not recently, but like say 10, 15 years ago, added some credibility to that argument that Turkey's civilization is booming and Turkish civilization is going to become dominant in the region and beyond. So I, my hunch is that this is the reason why this uh, position has become so dominant within the Turkish public opinion. Regarding the other question about the Sever syndrome and uh, this division of motherland and Turkophobia in Greece, I agree that there is some similarity and there is an asymmetry. For Greece, Turkey is the number one security concern, security threat, in light of 1974 events in Cyprus and, of course, the whole discussion about Aegean and sort of the gray zone disputes and so on. So there is a very strong argument within Greece that Turkey is questioning Greek sovereign rights. From the Turkish point of view, Greece is no more a major security threat, but as the Sever syndrome sort of uh, highlights, Greece can become part of a global conspiracy, quote, quote, in order to kind of partition Turkey. And then of course the Kurdish question and other crucial issues within Turkey play a big role. So in that respect, to get back to Senem's very important point, this ontological and security discussions are very relevant to understand why both countries feel so insecure about themselves and about their position in the world. So, Senem, the last uh, word is yours, so we can conclude in time. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I have two notes uh, dotted down here, which most of it has already been said already, and I don't want to repeat the same points, but just two things. One, Regarding the Sev syndrome, uh, Yanis, you rightly picked up the asymmetric nature of these phobias or syndromes on both sides. Now, when you think of the Sev syndrome, you have to remember that it, in the Turkish case, it relates more to 
uh, Turkey's fear of the West uh, overall. So it's not just Greece that we're talking about, but the primary reference there is often the United States or Europe, and Greece is somewhere in there, but it's not the primary reference point through which the Sarah syndrome is articulated. Whereas in the case of Greece, we see that Turkey there is the dominant other of the phobia or syndrome or fear or the ontological security. And in fact, we don't need to go far, but we, should, we could only look at the first wave of the data that we had produced in the context of this project to show that the, um, the, the sort of cluster of security, uh, the level of self-reliance or the feeling of self-assurance regard, with regard to security and defense was higher in the Turkish case than the Greek sense. So, so that shows that the sense of insecurity is higher on the Greek part. So there's, there is an asymmetry there, and it's an important one, an important conceptual distinction about Sarah's syndrome as well that we need to make uh, to make such an argument. And secondly, about the notion of culture superiority, well, of course, I'm sure this goes beyond political science to respond to that question. But as a political scientist, Yanis, I would echo your words in the sense that one part of the reason, I'm not sure this is the entire reason, but I think an important part of the reason has to do with the fact that the anti-Western discourse that the governing party has been pushing uh, the Turkish audience in the last 20 years or so, rests fundamentally, one of the pillars that it rests on is the superiority of the Turkish self. And not just in the cultural sense, but in terms of governance standards as well. You know, whether or not this is factually the case is another question. We're not living in a necessarily factual world, as you very well know. But the fact that, you know, we handled COVID better, we handled the 2008 global financial crisis better, We've come out all of these massive crises unscattered, unscratched, whereas Europe has been in shambles, including Euro crisis, the situation of Greece, the debt relief, COVID, etc. So every single notion of crisis uh, has been taken as an opportunity by the government to frame uh, Turkish self as superior in handling these as well, right? So it's not just a cultural issue. And it's sort of tied to Turkish culture and religion and history and all these kind of essentialist factors, that is a fact. Uh, but also it's tied very much to the way in which contemporary issues are presented, at least, as being having dealt with by the government and sort of, and in, and sort of tie this to a very superior sense of the Turkish self. I think that's an important part of the question. So I think I can finish it at that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And... Uh... We can conclude here our webinar. I would like to thank you, thank Elam, Dimitri, Senem for their very important contributions. I would like, of course, to thank our directors, Fuat Heyman and George Pagulatos, for helping us realize this event and realize this research. I would like also to thank Evrem Balta, who is uh, my partner in this uh, very important project. And uh, I would like to invite our uh, audience to stay tuned because we will, we will be producing more results. There is the third wave, which is coming soon. And as all of you have said, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, may become a, like a trigger for very interesting results uh, because this result, this event is likely to change perceptions between Greeks and Turks as the recent meeting of the two leaders in Istanbul has highlighted to some degree. So we look forward to studying this, hoping that we can contribute to better understanding between the two peoples and the two countries, and hopefully contributing to creating an environment whereby solutions of the dispute is possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>